Right, welcome Simon Borg, Olivier to Kieran Yoga, Yoga Chats. How are you doing? Very, very nice to see you, Adam. I'm doing very well, thank you, and thank you very much for having me once again. Yeah, it's good to see you. I think we've done at least three chats together now. Um, so trying to keep these slightly different from a regular podcast format, uh, we like to discuss a particular topic today. So Simon, in my view, is that your particular expertise is of breathing um, and breathing and moving together. Um, so just as a first foray into this topic to try and hook us into a discussion, um, where, where does the breath come into in into in terms of the moving like uh, how does the how does the breath relate to the moving because when i was first taught ashtanga it was almost and i often say this oh breathe and move in a kind of poetic manner oh you know you should breathe freely and you should move and the two things were still kind of separate right but as i understood it latterly in my, my, through my experience of practicing many years it's through the diaphragmatic breath that the moving comes so the breathing is actually making the moving rather than this idea that, you know, we just need to breathe freely and, you know, and move at the same time. That there's this fundamental link between the two, which is often still not discussed. That the diaphragm is essentially the, the very trampoline of our physical being, right? Um, so what do you have to say about that? Look, it's very, very interesting, very, very complex at its most you know, deepest part, but Maybe the, the simplest way to start is by saying that natural breathing is the key to most of our health. You know, people talk about the value of sleeping and how important it is. That's very big in the world today. But the one important thing that we do when we're sleeping is we breathe naturally. Predominantly, it's diaphragmatic breath. And the diaphragm is not just the muscle of breathing. The diaphragm is an important bridge between your conscious mind, your thinking active mind, and your unconscious mind or the autonomic nervous system. And because it's a bridge between the conscious and the unconscious, it can serve to really regulate your system to work in that default state, which should be the parasympathetic nervous system dominant state. Because it's that nervous system state, which we sometimes call rest, rejuvenation, relaxation, regeneration, which gives you the maximum function of your immune system, your digestive system, your reproductive system. And so if you can keep parasympathetic dominance, you have longevity. And along with this parasympathetic dominance, which is rest, rejuvenation, relaxation, which is almost like opposite to what they call the flight or fight response, mm. which is the sympathetic nervous system, mm. the rest rejuvenation relaxation system, which is meant to be your default natural state. You should be in really 99% of the time, you should be dominant in that. Mm. The subconscious emotions of that state are love and peace, happiness, trust, connection. Whereas if your sympathetic nervous system is dominating, then the subconscious emotions are fear, anger, aggression, lack of safety, lack of trust, which really, since we're living in a yoga world, they're the opposite of yoga. So the thing about breathing, which I think many people forget, is that breathing, if it's done diaphragmatically as that trampoline base that you so nicely put, is that then you start to access your subconscious and reset it to be parasympathetic dominant. But if you focus on breathing as being the thing we should do more of, as many people do, because often it's like, you should breathe more, you should mm. focus on your breath more. That's what we often hear. You should hear the sound of your breath. Mm. You should take deep breath into the chest. Most of those things, surprisingly to many people, actually stimulate a flight or fight response. They will stimulate the exact opposite of what uh, the diaphragm is meant to do, which is you know, help you regulate your nervous system and keep it in this more dominant rest rejuvenation relaxation state where you get good immunity, reproduction and digestion and have these peaceful, loving, emotional things which allow you to feel connected. But if you over-breathe and if you breathe into the chest and you bypass the diaphragm by, say, locking the core, as many people do, 
you know, thinking they may be doing some sort of a bunder, but actually all they're doing is inhibiting their diaphragm. Then what happens mm. is that you lose your connection to the subconscious, you become dominant in sympathetic, in the stress mode, and you turn off your immune system, digestive and reproductive system, and basically say, forget old age, you're just not going to get there. Or if you do, your body is going to be diseased and dysfunctional. So I think this is important. I think that, that breathing and working diaphragmatically has got these two key roles. One is it's the base of breathing, and that should be as little breath as possible. And the other mm. is gives you this uh, you know, connection to your unconscious mm -hmm. and your nervous system. Mm. Know, yeah. No, I always like what you say about breathing less and not more, and also doing less in a way. You know, it's, like, you know, mm. it's the kind of minimum effort, not the maximum effort that... You know, I, I kind of pull from a lot of your work, which, you know, I really, I really like. And the idea of training, you know, only 50 or 70 percent, right? Because, um, you know, yes, it's, but also, uh, it's, it's, it's sorry, I was gonna say, yeah, sorry. Al also, it's good to, um, you know, to generally train to sub-maximal levels. But yes, the potential to every once in a while and really go for it. Because if yeah, someone, well, it's like any athlete, isn't it? Like, you wouldn't, exactly, you know, exactly. yeah, you wouldn't kind of an athlete, you know, kind of performs once in a blue moon, right? You know, right? Like, you know, irregularly at least they don't perform to that level that they're doing the sprint every day in front of the audience, right? You know, like it's you know, regular training sessions are different, so they should be the same in anyone's practice. But um, going back to what you said, what you just said about the diaphragm and about the bunders, is it? A foregone conclusion that people will simply connect to the diaphragm if they're in a relaxed state, or is there any advice you can give as to whether and how one can connect to the diaphragm? You know, because people kind of say, "Well, do I know? Am I sure whether I am or not?" You know, I often hear this, right? Like I'm, 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 I feel like I may be breathing from the diaphragm, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one way of doing it is that you check that when you're breathing it feels relaxing, and then you have to compare with what relaxation feels like. So if you put yourself in a supine relaxation, say, then when you're in a supine relaxation, like when you're about to go to sleep at the end of a yoga practice, when you inhale, it should feel relaxing, and when you exhale, it should feel relaxing. You should right. feel the breath when it comes in, in the very lowest part of your abdomen. And when I say feel that, it should be that if you put your fingers into your soft abdomen, just above mm. the pubic bone, like between the navel and the pubic bone, but really close to the pubic bone. When mm. you inhale into a soft abdomen, it should feel like a balloon is expanding underneath the fingers, just above the pubic bone. Then you know that the diaphragm is functioning well. It should also feel like when you inhale, your pelvic floor is opening on the inhale. And also, well, that's a subtler feel, feeling, isn't it? It's a subtler feeling. It's more subtle. Yes. But uh, that, that, will, that can be used as well. And the other one is the lower back should feel like it's slightly expanding. If you feel all three, okay. lower back, pelvic floor, and lower abdomen, that's what a diaphragmatic inhalation should feel like. And a diaphragmatic exhalation right. should feel quite relaxed as well. That's mm. Hmm. What about if someone's stressed or have gone through particular traumas and, and we know that the diaphragm can be quite frozen and immobile. Um, mm -hmm. I had it myself. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. what do you do then if you just, when you're lying down, I mean, for example, in sleep, even uh, for a period of my life, I had, uh, I think what's called sleep apnea. Um, so you're actually not, <laughs> I hold my breath and I'm sleeping, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. it wakes my wife up, you know, because you hear these little squeakings, you know, yes, I'm holding my breath, you know, um, you know, what's what, you know, any advice for, for someone as uh, as hopeless as me um, in terms of you know, how to, uh, you know, facilitate uh, a reawakening of the diaphragm if it's rather he uh, held or, or tense? OK, there's a couple of clues. Firstly, as I'm discussing this, I'm talking about the way to awaken a diaphragm when your abdomen is relaxed. But what we also want further down the line is to be able to breathe diaphragmatically when the abdomen is tense. In other words, right. when it feels firm. Now, right. But when I'm first teaching people to use the diaphragm, the easiest thing to do is to tell them to relax the abdomen as much as right. possible. And that's why when you see young kids like babies who are really the epitome of youth and vitality, 
Their mm-hmm. abdomen is hanging out. When they're just standing there doing nothing, they have the little pot bellies. And that's actually a sign of health. And I always say to my students, Buddha wasn't fat. Buddha was relaxed. And that's why he had this little pot belly. It doesn't have to be fat, but if the abdomen is relaxing, it will actually tend to stick out a bit if you've had a little bit of food. But most people get told from their mothers when they're 12 years old, mm. from therapists, from uh, you know, exercise practitioners, that they have to pull their navel to the spine. And mm. most people mm. do this inappropriately. There is a way of drawing the navel to the spine, there's a couple of ways, where you can still breathe diaphragmatically. But from my studies on real-time ultrasound and you know observing people as mm. a therapist, probably 60 to 80 percent of people, when you either tell them tighten the abdomen or you tell them draw the navel to the spine, both of those activities will inhibit the diaphragm. Yes, because so they're just to... using the rectus abdominis muscles, right? And and right, and not, clen- clenching the no. No, no, not so much the rectus abdominis, actually. Right, It's, it's okay. the oblique muscles that actually, because there's, there's four sets of abdominal muscles. There's the uh, internal oblique, the external oblique, the rectus abdominis are quite surface, and the deep ones are the transversus abdominis. If they clench their abdomen using the external oblique and the internal oblique together, those muscles right. seem to act as the antagonists of the diaphragm. If hmm. those muscles okay. are tight, and the rectus abdominis is tight as well, it tends to less inhibit the diaphragm if done in a certain way. If the rectus abdominis is tightened by itself with no other muscles, that does not inhibit the diaphragm. Huh. Okay. So that, that, but the oblique muscles right. are often the ones that are most tense. Okay. This is what I found when I studied with real-time mm-hmm. ultrasound, but I was being guided by physiotherapy friends of mine who had previously done studies as well, and they found that most people's oblique muscles were tight. But rectus abdominis right. alone is the muscle Done. that would tighten. Okay. If you were lying on your back and you did a half sit-up, yeah. so your lower back yeah. is still on the floor, and yeah. you feel your abdomen, it would be firm at the front, and if you relax right. everything, the sides will go soft. And it looks like now just the ridge of the yeah. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And that muscle, yeah. you can breathe into the abdomen and feel fine. And you can still keep the diaphragm uh, well, mobile, mobile, yes. right? Yeah. With the oh, I didn't know that. Okay, well, thanks for that. Um, yeah. Right. So, what do you what, when you saying when you talk about bunda then? Uh, you know, um, what do we actually mean by bunda? Because when you mentioned at the start, regular use of bunda just means grip anything down there uh, as hard as you can, yes. right? You know, unfortunately, uh, you know, and then breathe into your throat in this kind of hissy kind of, yes. you know, it's a very unfortunate combination of, you know, of yes. two really sh- shallow breathing and then a very tense uh, abdomen. Um, mm. So what are we actually looking for there this, when we talk about bunda and the breath? Because, yeah. um, bunda is effectively the co-activation or simultaneous tensing of the muscles on opposing sides of a joint complex. And this is something you can determine by studying how Bandha was used by the, you know, in Light on Yoga they talk about Bandha, in um, a really cool book called Mula Bandha, the Master Key. Oh yeah, yeah. Several other really good books like this. Yeah, it's a great book, yeah. They gave yeah. a particular idea of what Bandha was. There was a lot of talk about yeah. Udiyana Bandha. There were studies on the Valsalva Manoeuvre and the Mula Manoeuvre. And then we have also what Patabi Joyce was saying, because that became a bit more prevalent in the West from the 1980s onwards where it started to get on. Before that, Iyengar and others had talked about Bandha, but they only ever talked about generally in Pranayama. Uh, Pat- Patabi Joyce was really the first one to say Bandha should be also engaged in posture and movement. So after studying all the different approaches to Bandha, the only conclusion we could sensibly make was that Bandha is a generalized term and Bandha is a subset of Mudra. Mudra means energy control and Bandha is a special type of energy control, which sometimes they call it a lock. And a lock is like a door. So when you close the door or when you close a lock, then you can't enter or leave that region. But a lock has the possibility of being in the unlocked position and the door can be open. So a bundle 
is a co-activation of opposing muscles around a joint complex, which can be in the position, in, in, a, in a form, which either locks and prevents blood flow and the movement of prana, or it can unlock and it can encourage the movement of blood or prana. So when we talk, say, for example, about Jalandhara Bandha, that's the head down and the neck back, the way it's done mm -hmm. in most Pranayama. When the head goes down, it tightens the front of the neck. When you push the neck back, it tightens the back of the neck. And that actually restricts pressure to the head if you're, say, doing an inhalation with tension and you hold your breath and tighten your abdomen, the pressure won't come to the head. But if you make a similar co-activation of the muscles around the neck by moving your throat forward and your chin up, and throat forward tightens the front of the neck, chin up tightens mm -hmm. back of the neck. It's the same mm -hmm. muscles used in a different way. That will actually encourage blood flow to the head. And so Jalandhara has two forms. One which is like a closed lock, one which is like an open lock. Mula Bandha and Uddiyana Bandha also have open and closed forms. And the Uddiyana Bandha that we commonly see, say, in the back of light on yoga, where you exhale fully, hold the breath out, and expand the chest, and it causes a suction. That is an expansive Bandha, which uh, will actually encourage blood flow to the chest and increase blood flow to the heart. But it's also possible to use the same muscles that we use to expand the chest to compress the chest. And that compression of the chest, that's also an Uriyana Bandha, which actually gives lack of, uh, you know, it, it changes mm -hmm. the blood flow. But Bandha also has a stabilizing function. And most people are obsessed with the stabilizing function of Bandha. They think right. of it like core stability. So when you mm -hmm. compress your chest, that gives tremendous stability to the spine. Now, your uh, Mula Bandha, we've often heard different things about it. You say that Mula Bandha could be a, um, a tightening of the pelvic floor, or it could be also a tightening of the lower abdomen or lower back or, or the whole abdominal region, the lumbar spine. But there's effectively two extreme forms of Mula Bandha. One will restrict blood flow while it hardens the abdomen, and the other one does not restrict blood flow while hardening the abdomen. The compressive Mula Bandha can be made in several ways, and you'll notice it most of all because it usually, in, in certain of its forms, inhibits the diaphragm, whereas the expansive Mula Bandha does not inhibit the diaphragm. And what it gives is a much more powerful strength in the abdomen. It still allows the core to move, and you can breathe into it. And it's actually the Bandhas, in terms of Mula Bandha and Uddiyana Bandha, Mm. are best explained and recognized when you look at what Patavi Joyce was teaching us. When he said, all you have to do if you want to learn his Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga was four things. One is do his sequence. Don't change the sequence. Two is observe Drishti. Look at the places he says to look at. Three is do... Um, Mula Bandha and uh, Uddiyana Bandha, and then four, do Ujjayi Pranayama. And so those things were fairly, you know, definite. he was definitely. Mm. But of course, many people stopped doing his sequence. Like they took out a very important part of the sequence because the most common posture in the Ashtanga Vinyasa practice, as I saw it, is uh, Utpluti or Lolasana, basically treating. So when you're doing Surya Namaskar, inhale, arms up, exhale, hands to the floor. Inhale is not just arch the back, it's the lift up and the float back before you lower onto the floor for Chaturanga Dandasana. And that should be done on an inhalation. And same when we're doing vinyasa between, you know, up dog, down dogs between each pose. It's inhale, lift up, exhale, push up, mm. inhale, up dog, mm -hmm. exhale, down dog, inhale, jump through. And that inhalation, if you do it into your abdomen, you have strength. If you try and inhale... And that's Bunda. The... the... Because I, I, what I particularly wanted to catch you on was the expansive nature of... Because we, when we talk of Bandha generally, it's, it's a stabilising factor, right? We know that, you know, the, the, the stabilising, contractive, compressive factor of Bandha, it, I think, is the way that we generally understand it. But can you can clarify a little bit what the expansive nature of the Udiana Bandha would, would look like? Okay. Well, can I move back a little bit away from the camera and I can actually 
actually show you. This. Oh, right. Great. Yeah. Really yeah. Like. Wonderful. I, I moved yeah, I would. Really Very much. Yeah. And yeah. Then you can see here. Oh, you even got them out there. Fantastic. <laughs> so yeah. if I'm here like this, and I'll take off my, my, my thing, right? So you can see. There's my yeah. abdomen, right? Now, if I stand like this, I look reasonably okay. If I let my abdomen relax, then it goes out like that. Okay? I've, I've drunk a lot, and it's all belly. If I tighten it, you can hear it's quite tight. I can't pinch much. There's not that much fat. But we're discouraged to let the abdomen hang out. It's not something that girls want to do walking around the beach. So we're always told to put it in. Now, when you pull the abdomen toward the spine, you can do it in three, in four main ways. If I pull the navel toward the spine and use oblique muscles of the abdomen uh, or, or exhalation muscles, this happens. And you can see that my navel went closer to the spine. If I use postural muscles like the rectus abdominis and I do that, again, you can see the navel pulls closer to the spine. Both of them are types of Mula Bandha. They both look like I've compressed. But the difference is, if I put my fingers into the soft abdomen, and I do the first one, the exhale muscles, the oblique muscles, this happens. <sighs> my abdomen tightens and goes in, and it feels like it's pulling away from my fingers. But that's that, right? If I do the postural muscle activation, this, it looks similar on the outside. But when I put my fingers in and I tighten the rectus abdominis, that happens. It pushes the abdomen out. So it looks like I'm pulling it in, but it feels like I'm pushing it out. And anyone right. can do this. They could try it right now if they were to put their fingers in the abdomen and lean, and lean back. As soon as you lean back, you feel the abdomen pushing out against your fingers. But if you were to see that from a relaxed abdomen, it looks like it's pulling in, but it feels like it's pushing out. And, that particular and that's the expansive nature. That's an expansive. Pushing out. Yes. But that, it, it shouldn't feel like you're trying to defecate. It's not, it shouldn't feel like your heart is trying to push out. It just, should, it just naturally come out. And that will happen naturally if you do a half sit up. And it happens also in lolasan, in that movement. You see, in that position, when I lean back here and my abdomen is firm, I can inhale to my abdomen. I feel the breath. But if I exhale fully, and use my abdominal muscles of exhalation, then I can't breathe, he'll have to breathe into the chest.